All right. So, uh, welcome to B Talks. This is the July version, and it's a very important one for a couple of reasons. We get to talk about um, swarm season sort of ending, if folks are wondering about that. We also get to talk about harvest and honey, which we will bolt, we will give physical uh, demonstration at the bee yard on the, Paul, it's the 22nd, right? Is Paul there? Paul, you're going to have to keep your mic on. Paul Zelinsky. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. 20, 26. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a, a wonderful lineup starting in um, uh, August. We have a lineup of wonderful speakers, and one of them, which is um, Marlo Spivak. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss that one if, if I were you. And I would also make an effort to get to the B yard for our, our demonstrations and question and answer stuff that we're gonna be doing. Our B yard is in great condition. It did swarm a bit and you, you'll be able to see if you come to the B yard, you'll be able to see the consequences of a swarm that did not make a really fecund queen. By fecund, I mean, she wasn't really um, uh, fertilized well. And you can see the consequences of that. And you'll also be able to see colonies that swarmed and made a great yard queen. And the difference in the population and all of that will be evident and, um, and very instructional if you come and wonder about why maybe one of your colonies didn't do well after it swarmed and, and one of them did. Or, or just to learn that, yeah, you know, you can, a colony can swarm and then come back and make honey that same year. So it's not um, totally... It's it's generally not good for honey production, but um, it can it can happen anyway. And and our colonies did that. One of them, one or two of them, made a lot of honey, even though they swarmed. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I want to I'll show you what went on. Let's see. All right, Paul, you're going to answer my questions. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I mean like things like, can you see my? <laughs> oh yeah, I can see it. Okay, that's yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. All right, so take a look at June, starting <clears throat> at June third, and all the way down through June thirtieth. And you know, we're not going to go over these blooms because we did this in um, previously. But uh, think about or just look at the quantity. And some of them are very, very productive blooms. Some of them are not. Some of them are just regular old um, uh, blooms. But there's a couple of sumacs in there. There's smooth. There's uh, staghorn. And there is winged is also in there. I don't think I have it down there, but it's probably in there. It's coming on or it's coming on right now. So we had great seasons for those sumacs. We had a great basswood flow this year. And so June is a big, uh, well, the Canadian thistle, the milkweed is out, elderberry, blackberry, all the um, all the brambles. So the bees are busy in June. That's why they're. That's why we harvest lots of times around this time in July. And here's the reason why. So here's July's total bloom, right here. It looks a little impressive, but there aren't a lot of real productive blooms there. And we're down to like. Blue vervain, you might not have that in your area. It's it's a low lying, um, beautiful uh, native wildflower that's that might might as well just be as good as purple loosestrife for bees. And purple loosestrife is also out. Um, hyssop is out. Plantain is out for uh, folks that see that kind of uh, pale pollen coming back. Button bush, if you're near any kind of lowland or swampy area, you'll have a bunch of button bush. That's a productive plant for lots of pollinators and honeybees also will, um, will sometimes work it. Bee bombs in there, tall metal root, just a beautiful thing to look at. And um, <clears throat> the second half of June is a, of July is a little bit more productive for us. So we'll, we'll end up with the, you know, field, the field uh, weeds, Ironweed, who knows why they call it that. Um, common thistles out. Um, sweet, white sweet clover. And I saw some of that out already. Now that's a really productive 
honey plant, but not for our area. And then we end the um, July with um, secondary blooms, you know, burdock, Joe pie weed, which is a, a, around a whole lot, but I'm not sure how much honey they make out of them. So if you look at the total productive floral sources in July, they don't even come close to what uh, we saw in June. So at the end of June, when basswood sort of goes off, goes out of, uh, turns off, um, you could end up in the first week or two of July, you could end up with bees eating back their stores. And that happened very classically in, um, in, in our bee yard where we had singles. This, this year we um, tried five singles and they, they made a ton of honey all through June. They put up two, they would have, they would have put up three um, boxes of honey, but I didn't want to push them. But what they did was when they hit that little bit of dearth at the end of June, they they then started to eat back the, um, well, actually they hit it a little bit earlier in June, about a week before the end. And then when uh, basswood came on, they filled that same that second super up again, right? It's with nectar. And now I noticed that it's kept honey. So um, yeah, they were waiting on that basswood bloom. Now we have a lot of it in my area and we have a lot of it in the where the bee yard is. So that's why it served as a great restorative nectar flow for the little bit of dearth that the bees got. All right, so uh, any other contributions to this bloom calendar that folks can make? Or have they seen something that, I, I'm sure I'm missing plenty of blooms here that people see their, um, like privet, I don't have that. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of that around. And uh, so anybody have a contribution? No, yes. Um, I don't accept to say, um, you mentioned that the white uh, clover isn't much of a source. Um, I have a, a ball field right practically in my backyard and boy, the bees are all over that white clover. You don't think they're bringing much in now? Oh, okay, so that's that's white Dutch clover. Yeah. All right. So so I'm talking about um, sweet clover. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Clover is a, a little bit of a different plant. It's um, it's um, it's it's what clover honey was is originally made from out in places you know like um, uh, Iowa and <clears throat> North Dakota, and it grew in the ditches. It grew wild, and it was you know they they claimed it wasn't invasive, so they they you know they eradicated it. But that's what clover honey like Sue B. clover honey comes from white sweet clover, but you will see not a whole lot of it, but you will see some of it in Connecticut. And you also see last year was a great year for purple loosestrife. Don't, don't tell the envir environmentalists that I said that, but, but this year I haven't seen a whole lot of it, um, <clears throat> but maybe somebody else has. Anything else, Michael, you got anything? I see Michael Lunds on here. Hey, Bill. Um... Hi, Michael. The knotweed is slowly starting. Yeah, now I noticed that, but and I can't really figure out why. You got any ideas? Um, last year it started at the end of June, and it seemed to be like according to size. It seemed like the little dinky plants had flowers first, and the real big tall monsters had it late in the season. So yeah, because... it's an invasive that's like figuring it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, see, I don't, I don't really, I didn't, I don't call knotweed in my area till like the middle of August. And that's when I see it. And that's when I see it just going crazy. But I am seeing it set flowers or, or buds, or however you want to, whatever you want to call them. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so uh, one other thing that I forgot to mention, dog bane is out all over the place. If you have dog bane, it's in the milkweed family. It's a wonderfully sustaining bloom. You won't make any honey, your bees won't, um, uh, they can't live on just dog bane, but it will sustain them. They, they work it all day long and it's like, they work it like crazy. And uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm looking forward to my BB tree coming online somewhere around August 4th. 
All right, so if there are no other questions, I'll stop that share and we can start. Or, or do you want to ask any other questions about Blooms? Phil, do you mind uh, going live? Yeah, I know. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Good. Thank you, Phil. Good, good. So uh, in recent years, I, I think I mentioned this to you, I haven't been really producing much honey. This year, different. Yeah. This year, I've been producing honey, which has been great. And about, oh, I don't know, a week or a little more ago, I decided to take a super off um, to remove some of the frames. And so I put in a skateboard on. What kind of a skateboard? Um, you know, it's a store-bought one. I, I don't know the difference between them, really. But, you know, it's got the ra a round hole on the upper side and the triangle on the bottom. So oh, it's a tri So that's called a triangle B escape. Okay. So let's get a photo. Somebody, somebody wants to get a photograph of up on the, on the uh, internet, and we'll share it. Um, you can share it on your screen so, so all the people can see what he's talking about. So anybody that wants to do that is welcome to do it. Go ahead, Phil. Okay. So, um, you know, I put my skateboard on. And I went back the next morning, and everything was great. Uh, the super was practically empty. There were one or two stragglers in there, but every, they, the rest of them had gone down. And so I took the box off, and uh, I put my, my uh, inner cover on and my top cover on, and uh, I, I took the box away. And <clears throat> I brought it back to the shed. I took a deeper look into the box and I had, you know, like maybe five nicely capped frames, but I had several that were maybe 50% capped. So mm. I said to myself, well, okay, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put these back in along with a few other frames, uh, you know, just um, drawn out frames and I'll see if they'll cap, finish capping these guys. So I put them back in uh, the next next day, and um, I left them for several days. And I decided finally that uh, I, I I ordered a refract out refractometer, which I had never had before, and because I've never really checked the moisture content of my honey, uh, you know I haven't been producing that much honey, right? So I I ordered one of those, and um, I decided I'm going to take the the uh, the frames back out. So I install my uh, escape board a second time, okay. and the next morning I come back, which was uh, yesterday morning. I go back to uh, remove the super, and I I I, I uh, pull the there it is. Thank you. Yep, I pull the super off, and I so I can see the top of the escape board, and I've got like a thousand dead bees on the top of the, um, the skateboard. And uh, the hole in the center, that round hole we just saw, that thing has you know, got all bees in it. So I, I dead bees. I lift up the escape board, flip it over, and the whole triangle, all those little channels that are in the triangle with the dead skateboard. Dead bees, there's dead bees in all of them. They're all packed, jam packed with dead bees. Yeah. And then I take a closer look at the super, and the portions of the uh, frames that I put in that were capped were still capped, but the honey was stripped out of uh, the, the uncapped portions. And I had a couple of uh, complete, several complete frames in there that were, uh, you know, filled with honey, uh, but not capped at all. And those were mostly stripped out. And I did bees got uh, yeah so going, yeah go so ahead. somehow somehow or another your bees got robbed yeah and well, I don't why know are they that, dead how that because they well I don't know why I can't really tell you why they died but you can if you leave a triangle bee escape on too long it was only part, overnight yeah I know I know but it, but I'm saying if you leave it on too long sometimes bees will die in it but yeah. what you're explaining is somehow or another bees got into some kind of a contest where they killed each other or something because they won't die like that if they can get through that escape and it's a proven device because you used it the first time right so somehow or another and with the missing honey piece of it 
I'm just guessing, but my guess would be that they got robbed somehow yeah. or they were in a I, robbing I, situation. Yeah. There was one other kind of, I don't know if this is significant or not, but I found as I was, you know, panicking and going through the, uh, through the super, I found two bumblebees. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they're really bumblebees. They're native. No, bees. but no, they're, they're, they're other, but they're bees that got in the colony, which is another, which is another um, sort of proof in this, in this dream we have about your problem um, yeah. that, that there was some bees that were allowed in. So go back and check and see if that that hardware had a leak, a bee leak in it somewhere, you know, open a top entrance for the honey super or something like that. Huh. All right. I'll check that out. You know, I, it, the um, the amazing thing is the the rest of the activity uh, in the in the deep in the deeps, you know, was like normal that everything seems yeah. to be they're very active and yeah, you know. and I mean, you overestimated how many bees were dead in that uh, super too. Maybe, maybe you've got three hundred bees that died in there, not a thousand. I, I hope mean, so. Yeah, and so that's really nothing to lose. Knock them out, um, you know, yeah. and, and then just go on. You're all, you're okay. Okay. So well, I don't think for that you know, if you have any brainstorms, let me know. Yeah, um, if I do, um, you'll <laughs> see uh, you'll see smoke coming out of my head. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Lauren, are we going to talk about you now? <clears throat> Uh, I have too many bees. <laughs> What's Lauren has too many bees. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, um, so I've been thinking about a program that we're going to offer starting right now, actually, we'll start it tonight um, at the bee yard where we have a nice field that we're not using, but we will put a, an electric fence around it. But I'm going to allow people to bring a colony or two there and um, and they can adopt and somebody else can adopt it. So if you don't have, for instance, if a person is looking at you, Lauren, right now and saying, I'd love the bees, but I don't have any place to put them. What I'm suggesting is that we could put them in, C in our bee yard and then they would be responsible to take care of them there. So it's, or they could, you know, so it's like an adopt a hive. Somebody who doesn't want another property. Yet. So I'm offering that. Um, I don't exactly know how the program would run. They can also, I'm thinking, adopt a colony in the yard itself. So one of ours from CBA, they, where they can come in and, and I'm available to uh, go to the yard almost any time. So, <clears throat> you know, I think the program will work on my schedule and anybody else's schedule. So I know I'm not really clear about this because I haven't really thought it through, but um, I guess the bottom line is I'm offering space in the CBA B, Boulder No B yard. For it's people. like the community garden. Yeah, it's, it's like a CSA, yeah. but it's a BSA. Yeah. You know, it's um, right no, idea. it's a, wait a minute. It's community supported beekeeping. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, uh, it's a CBA. No, it's, what is that? Connecticut. Yeah. CSB. C CSB. <laughs> <laughs> it's a CSB. All right. So if anybody... Uh, wants to take us up on that, you know, let me know. You can you can um, email us at info at ctbs.org. That's our official email. And we can make arrangements to um, bring Colony over there. And your, your responsibility for in, in the adoption part to make certain that it's cared for. You know, in other words, um, you know, fed when it needs to be inspected, uh, treated for varroa mites, all of that. You're adopting a colony. Like a dog, right, Lauren? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All, right. All right, now, Jeff, this is this is one of my favorite um, chat questions of all time. I love this one. A bear visited our yard but left our hives alone. Why? Yeah, Jeff, why? Jeff, who do, who would ask that question? Come on, man. That's I feel like, lucky. Huh? <laughs> I feel lucky. Yeah, no. I mean, is the colony dead? The colony dead. Um, no, he didn't. The beer didn't touch it. No, is the colony dead? Do you know if the colony's alive? No, it was before our first harvest. It was filled oh. with honey. All right, so the colony was filled with honey and bees. Yeah. All right, yeah. Well, you know. <clears throat> you want to see the video? Do you want proof that it, there was really a bear? Absolutely, man, because we don't believe this. <laughs> we need to see this. Yeah. Okay. My God. 
Where is this? It's Quaker Hill, which is Waterford near New London. Really? Yeah. So where's the colony? The colony would have been, um, oh, where'd you go? Uh -oh. I don't know. It must have ended and just stopped. You can start it again. Uh, here. Here, just want to. Okay, there we go. Um, the colony, so th the bear was walking uh, from right to left. Yeah. Go up a little more right, and there were uh, 10 colonies right there. 10? We walked right past them. No electric fence yet. <laughs> well, I mean, so this is when an anemometer will come in handy. Like what I would have done is go back and look at my weather station data and see which direction a wind was blowing because oh. that, <laughs> that bear is basically not, they, they don't have good earsight, eyesight, but they do have wonderful sense of smell. So yeah. it's possible you just got lucky that, you know, that the wind was blowing in the wrong direction. You didn't see it. Absolutely. You're lucky. not complaining about this though, right, Jeff? No, no, no. But I'm planning on... Um putting in an electric fence and I have Randy Oliver's uh, PDF for doing that. But one oh, of the- to put that kind of electric fence in, okay. Yeah. And um, my, um, my one thing I was worried about is putting this eight foot grounding rod into New England soil because I can barely put my shovel in before I hit rocks. <laughs> yeah, all right. So you don't need an eight foot grounding rod, first of all. All right, so you only need to put in a grounding rod that's about, um, 24 inches long right okay. so yeah so um and in and if, if you wanted to drive an eight foot rod in you can put it in on a 30 degree angle on an so it doesn't need to go straight down either okay yeah in new england you're not likely to be able to get i of course in a former life i was an electrical contractor and i put in electrical services and had the biz had the my business was putting ground rods in okay and so they were difficult exactly difficult you know they were really really difficult to get in at eight feet long um so uh, we took other measures and then the code allowed us to put them in at an angle but the one you need is a galvanized rod that only goes down about 12 inches would be fine wow okay is that because new england soils um moisture no, no, it's because, uh, no yeah no i you know he has yeah randy has no randy has sand and desert where he is i mean there's no yeah. humidity in the air there's nothing like that no Eight foot ground rod, way overkill. Okay. All right. So you don't need them. The, the rods that come with the electric fences are only uh, 24 inches long. Okay. All right. And they'll work fine. So don't worry about that piece of it. You're I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're going <laughs> to, you know, and technically, you know, you have to, you have to call the utility company. If you're going to drive a rod into the ground, an eight foot rod, especially, you would have to call a call before you dig legally to drive that rod so you know so you don't want to even get involved with that okay um okay thank you there's no there's no time that a bear's not hungry so don't think that, that <laughs> well we have a video of of an, a neighbor so uh five or ten houses away chomping on a bird feeder oh so i guess it was hungry maybe looking for bird feed instead of honey or hasn't discovered oh, wow. the pleasures yeah. of honey yet you got to make sure that you're you know so i would buy your neighbor a couple you know buy him a 10 or 15 pound bag of bird seed <laughs> yeah <laughs> you keep that keep that thing over there yeah really all right so all right just uh, so forget about comment. that what's that jim so i had a i had a bear experience like that 2 years ago Came through my yard. I had about eight beehives all filled up all around the yard. And there was a bear in the neighborhood, hit another beekeeper and um, for a dozen yeah. hives. Yeah. Walked through my hive and left scat in the middle of the yard filled with bird seed. I have a neighbor that feeds the geese six, nice. six, six chewy boxes a week, huge chewy boxes. <laughs> of bird seed that bear chose the unnatural food for the i mean chose that bird seed instead of natural food i just well, couldn't believe it i the footprints yeah. were in the front yard and the mulch where it came right up walked between all the hives and ignored everything and it was just chuck filled with bird seed 
So, you know, that's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, bears are smart, right? I mean, we we know that. And it's possible that bears are somehow getting aware that they need more fiber in their diets, you know, so they're, they're going for bird seed, <laughs> you know, so who knows? Uh, that's a great story. And anyway, Jim, you know what? It's great to hear from you, man. I haven't heard from you for a long time and um, you're bringing back memories of old the old days and uh, good to hear from you, man. Okay, do we have a veterinarian? Oh, uh, on a retainer through the seat? No, we do not. Um, who would you recommend? I don't have a recommendation for you, but Darlene, when you find somebody, so I guess you're saying you want somebody to come out for uh, Fumagillin, and then I'm going to, of course, ask you why. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm looking for a veterinarian on retainer because we don't have we don't have animals that need a vet. Yes. But if I were to treat for um, foul brood, prophylactic, prophylactically or prophylactics, yeah. Um, the only way that I can get a tetracycline or tylosin would be through a veterinarian. Right. So, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. But uh, so there's no reason for you to prophylactically feed fumagillin to any beacon. Oh, not, not fumagillin. Oh, the tylosin or the tetracycline is the only thing that I can, that I would need for well, the treatment, yes. the pre-treatment of foul brood. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, you definitely wouldn't want to do that either. All right, so you don't have to put in um, any kind of prophylactic. As a matter of fact, that's totally um, recommended that you don't do that okay. because what, all right. So because what we're doing, what you're doing at that point is um, really strengthening in that, that um, bacterial community um, ahead of any kind of an infection. So um, not not necessary. We should probably investigate who would work with our organizations. And, and so it's something that I think we should try to find out. OK, because if we do end up with a problem, we're going to go, you know, you're going to you're going to end up. In our in our state, by the way, if you get foul brood, not European foul brood, but if you get American foul brood, your colony is no longer your own. You know, it's it's right. then owned by our um, our uh, ag station, and they'll and they'll burn it. So we're a burn state. Hey, Bill. Yes, Clifford. Bill, this is Cliff Bechtold. I can. I can How are you, man? Huh? Hey, you're doing all right. I can I can look into that. My daughter's actually doing a farm D rotation, veterinary health, no and kidding. her. And her preceptor is, keeps bees. Uh, and so we had just a whole topic discussion around this. Um, so I'll take this out. I'll, I'll look in to see what we can get. Okay. Get that somebody here from wonderful. the state to help. Thank okay, you. great. Are you back in the States? Yeah, I am for a couple of weeks. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, yeah, please do. I mean, that would be great. And, um, you know, I don't know if we, if, if it would cost us to put somebody on um, retainer or not. I don't think so, but we'll try that. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess the question is, does it need to be a veterinarian or could it, I mean, pharmacists are licensed to prescribe. So I'll look into that, all those aspects. Uh, they, no, it's a veterinary, we, no, it's a directive that, that it has to be a vet. So the problem is that we don't, and there's a shortage, a national significant shortage of any um, veterinarian that has bee knowledge. So that's that's the problem, you know, and and technically they're supposed to come out and administer the actual uh, dosage, but of course they don't have to. But, um, you know, I think I'm going to talk to Dave Peck up at Better Be. I think he has um, someone that does it for um, their area. So anyway, but but Clifford, that would be great. OK, good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, and then the and then the fumagillin, the fumagillin B. Yeah. Um, do you have a supplier other than to Don? Well, you can buy. No, I don't know. I think you can buy it from Man Lake also. Okay, man. I think man. Um, I actually called. I believe I called Didant today because um, of the expiration dates and everything out there was until April twenty twenty four. So I don't know if you have somebody that you can recommend that would be 
a little cheaper than Danan? I mean, for again, like we don't we don't use that prophylactically. Okay. All right. So that's not something you should do, you know, and you might only see, you might only find you would use that when there were, you know, when there's a call for it. Not not prophylactically. It's very um, dangerous uh, to do it that way. All right, before we go on to the next question, Kristen, so you have your hand raised. Let's take your question, please. Thank you. You can mute me. Hi. Hey, so um, when we were harvesting this year, I noticed, um, so we pulled about a box and a half off. We, don't, we only have three hives, so we pulled about a box and a half off, um, but a lot of the rest. So I would say four super, something like that. Um, it was only 50% cap, so we left it on the hives. We kind of like, you know, picked, right? So we went through each super and picked the ones that were fully capped out and it ended up being like a super and a half worth, which is actually a good thing because we only had a five gallon bucket and it basically filled a five gallon bucket. But my question is, is it worth going back in in a little bit to see if they've capped it? Because I, I sort of feel like we're in a, we're, if we're not in a dearth, we're heading there um, shortly, or should we just leave it and wait till fall? Or I guess the question is, do you think it'll be capped? I actually shook it. I did the shake test thing and nectar came out. So it needed time. It wasn't. Uh, well, it, nectar came out. So you, I don't know if you remember earlier, I was explaining how we ran into that little dearth and the bees ate back that honey. I'm, I'm guessing that that honey was capped. Oh, okay. And that they, they used it. And now they're back filling it with nectar. So yes, it will become, my guess is if you let it in there long enough to the end of, you know, when we get into the knotweed flow and all of that and a goldenrod, it's so late in the season, they might be capped again. Okay. I was just wondering if it was worth checking again. So yeah. Yeah, it is. And yep, you can do that. All right. Um, okay. So let's get back to Ann then. Let's go there. And so, Ann, you have a few questions. And how do bees know when to cap honey? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so do they, do they know when to ca cap it? Absolutely. Bees will never cap honey unless you're in um, some places in Southeast Asia um, and you're in other bee species, they'll cap honey at really high moisture contents, 21% uh, or something like that. But even then it won't ferment because of the nature of that honey. But here, bees will cap honey somewhere between 15 and 18% moisture content. If you live near um, a uh, river or wetlands area, you're gonna get wetter honey. And you know, so it'll be up in the 18% range. And my, my honey harvest, I, I never got dry honey. And, and never and never do get dry honey. So um, I usually get up around um, nineteen percent or something. So and and my stuff never never ferments, but it's got high. So they know exactly when to cap it. Um, so in other words, all capped honey is okay to harvest. That's the okay. Point. I but, too. I so you have two young colonies. What do you want to talk about then? Well, um, uh, one of them I requeened about um, three weeks ago. Okay. And because it was a package and it was a, a intercast queen, she wasn't laying anything. An intercast. Well, I think she wasn't laying any eggs. Okay, so an intercast is a queen between a queen and a worker. All right. So if it's if a queen is is made from an old larva, too old, then it'll be an intercast. So that's, I, so I think probably your queen wasn't, wasn't um, fertilized well. Anyway, she wasn't laying, so I requeened, I requeened the colony and it's doing fine. Um, and it has a kind of a funky uh, brood pattern, but every, everything looks healthy. And there are full frames, but there are no drones and no drone cells. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, the drones all emerged and whatever that other queen did or didn't do, um, you know, they were, now you sure, how long was that colony without, a, they always had a queen. You took the old queen out and put a new one in, right? Yes. 
Okay. And you saw eggs. With, with a new queen? Yes. Oh, yeah. She's got great fruit. Okay. So cool. That's what you're... So you've got a little bit of time. You're right on the edge. Now, the second week in July is the last time we recommend starting new colonies. But you can do it. So she still has three or four brood cycles. You, that, that colony's... Your job is just to get it to winter. And over that's winter. that's what that's all I want to do. Okay, so that's that's just basically what's going to happen now. You know, if you can make splits this time of year, queen right splits. You know, but it's your, you know, if you get to the third week of July, it typically is not good in Connecticut for starting a new colony or introducing a new. You can introduce queens on really strong queen right colonies. That's not a problem, but the one that you're trying to bring back from the brink. Um, about the second week in July is your last chance. To oh, she's been in there for probably about three weeks now. Oh, okay. You're cool then. You got everything going yeah. on. Okay. And then I have um, a second hive that um, was a package and um, had a slow start, but it's doing great now. And there are no drones in that either. Well, um, yeah, well, there were there drones. When, when did you install that package? Uh, May? Early May. Yeah, I mean, they, but there were, there were drones there at that point. I mean, they had them, that package had to make drones. My guess is I've never seen a colony that never, that didn't make drones. Every colony makes them. Even that's if, what I, that's, yeah. that's why I'm perplexed. <laughs> yeah, so am I. If, if those Queens, if those colonies didn't make drones, I would be very surprised. You might not have noticed them because they were in between the bottom bar and the top bar. Do you are you running double deeps? Uh, it's a uh, um, Slovenian hive. Oh, hmm. maybe they didn't like that hive. The drones didn't like those. Hives. Well, and they went away with all the mites. Yeah, they took the mites with them. I mean, the la I did a, I did in uh, June. I did a mite wash, and there were there were no mites, zero, zero. Yeah, that's you can get that in June. Try it in August. I'm I'm going to do it late July for again. <laughs> All right, but you, you, the later you wait, the more drunk, the more the more of a row you'll see. Uh, you know, June I put in a just a little anecdotal story about the bee yard. I thought, let me test out the temperature limits on Formic Pro, because there's a lot of discussion about how it'll kill queens and kill and fry brood. And yes. All right. So so I put it in on an 80 degree day and the following three days were 90 degrees plus. So um, so I violated the temperature profile and I put a whole um, double dose in there. So I put two pads for a 14 day treatment. So if you if you come to the yard on, on uh, the 22nd, the bee yard, <clears throat> you'll see whether or not I cooked that colony or the queen's still alive. So it's just uh, something I, I did. I didn't put formic in the whole yard, which I was planning on doing, but when, when Paul and I got there, um, and uh, we said, uh, not a good idea because of the way things are going to go weather-wise for the last, for the next couple of days. And then since then, um, we're in the typical problem with treatments, you know, where you can't put them in because you're over the temperature limit. Maybe so even this, this, week is still, this is still a study in progress? Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to put any more in, but, you know, I, I, uh, I want to see if, what happened to that queen. Bill. I, it, yeah. I did the same thing. You did the so, same thing? Yep. Oh, Ralph, how you doing, man? Good. <laughs> Are you in California or Connecticut? No, I'm in New York. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in New York, yes. All my, right. last bee, my, my last year of beekeeping, but I put them in just before that heat wave, but I only put one pad in, so I'll compare my results to your results. Yeah, let me know see. how many, you see what you killed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a reason for choosing the colony that I did. You know, my, the colony I, the colony that I put the double dose in was having an, an extraordinarily unusual biological uh, phenomenon occurring where the bees were uh, from the same colony, not being robbed, but were finding their way and living underneath the colony 
and I, and I dumped it upside down twice trying to look for a queen. I couldn't figure it out. And then they were killing each other on the, on the, um, on the landing board and I put robber screens on. I couldn't stop this behavior. So I said, let me just smoke it out. So that's what I did. With Formic. With Formic <laughs> to try to okay. cure them, of, to cure the cure their senses a little. I mean, it's like, you know, I was giving them kind of a uh, neti pot, you know, for their, uh, yeah. <laughs> for their pheromones. I, I have yeah. one more question. That's like a non-prescription use. Yeah, you know, it's off label. Go can ahead. I make a comment on Anne for Anne about sure. her lack of drones? Sure, you sure. Can. Um, the only thing I'm thinking about uh, is, I mean, because I use drone comb removal, and so I don't get, you know, I don't get drone. I only get drones in the drone comb. But uh, when you use foundation and you're forcing them to work, draw a worker brood, the the likelihood of them just drawing laying workers is higher and that's not to say that they're not going to put the drones in between like you said you know underneath the bars or whatever but that, that's another possibility yeah they'll i don't know what that slovenian hive is it a long hive in or does it's it have, three, it's three tiers it's what, three how much three space, levels 10 frames yeah. so how much space is between the bottom bar and the top bar of the next frame is there a b space in there or they can't or they it's can't? a it's a b space all right so uh, I can't explain it then. Sorry. It's a B space. All right. So I have one more question, Bill. I there was, I took a video of it. There was something that a bee was carrying around that looked like a balloon, a sack of a sack a fluid sack. Well, um, well, that would be sack brood. Pardon? I mean, if, if it's a fluid sack, then that would be sack brood. No, it was it was it was carrying a. I I can send you if I can send you the video. I like that. Okay, yeah, send send me the video or share it right now. I mean, you can do that if you want. Um, do I, I don't know how. So to did do the stack have writing on it, like Amazon Prime or anything? No. That was, that was a joke. <laughs> Come on, guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is free delivery yeah. product free placement delivery. i mean you don't know what they're up to i mean they could be you know they're going to be using drones and was a drone carrying a sack or was it no never mind there was no drone in that time i went too far with it go ahead i had one last question there were two single um capped brood cells that were taller than the whole frame those are drones. I mean, were they coming well, out straight or were they were they hanging down like peanuts? Going straight. Yeah, those are drones. Those are like, so those are drone, that's where they laid their drones. So if you can see on um, they'll they'll lay them on the top bar, near the top bar, under the top bar, anywhere, and you'll see, or sometimes they scatter them in with brood a little bit over on the left side or right side of the frame. But those are drones. I don't I don't think so because I broke it and and it it wasn't a pupa in it. It well, was liquid. Well, you, you, so you broke it and it was liquid? All I can think is it was a rotted pupa. And you're saying you don't have any disease in that column? And not, no other signs of disease. All right, let's see. I have a hive with two deeps and one shallow. There's an excluder between the deeps and the shallow, and both deeps are drawn out. The bees are strong, a lot of honey into the upper deep with a minimal amount of brood. They are now starting to draw out the shallow, but doing almost nothing in the lower deep. Thoughts about how to get more activity in the lower deep, or is this even a problem? No, it's not a problem. So you're just observing what the bees are doing in that colony. There's no reason for you to try to do a manipulation in it. Um, you know, bees are fine with one deep. They don't know, need to, but there's probably uh, a lot going on. There, there's probably some things going on in that lower deep. If things work like they normally work with two deep colonies, that bottom one will be a little bit sparse of resources and bees during this time of year. Um, as things progress and they fill that top deep with honey, they'll move the brood nest down to the lower box and you'll come into the fall with um, more honey in the top box and the brood down below it. So that's how it classically happens. Does that ever happen to me? 
hardly because I'm running mostly um, <clears throat> singles these days. All right. Uh, so how, how many pounds of honey should be left? All right, so that's a, that's a question for um, uh, some other time, especially when we get closer to winter, uh, but you should leave um, enough honey so the colonies can get through the winter. That would be 50 pounds maybe or, or plus. The don't think you need to put 70 or 100 pounds in there. It just has to be positioned right. And that's a, you don't want to take, if, you have, if you're running singles and then you take all their honey off, you're going to starve them. So you have to feed them immediately. If you're running doubles and they put a lot of honey in that top box, you can harvest your supers and you don't really have much of a problem. Um, and in Wallingford Cheshire area where you are, they will take advantage of the knotweed flow. The knotweed's more consistent than goldenrod, but if they both come on big this year, you'll have plenty of um, honey in that top box and you'll be fine. Ben, you wanna, you wanna talk about that? Sure, yep. Go ahead. So uh, my wife and I inspected our only hive on Sunday. And uh, as I said, I found that, uh, we found that um, there were no visible eggs in either of the two deeps. Uh, we didn't see any capped brood either, but we did see a small amount of uncapped larva. Um, we did see a couple of uh, open queen cups that hadn't been closed up and a couple that looked like they had been closed up, the peanuts on the side of the, the side of the frames. Yes, yes. So it, I'm guessing that they're not queen right. Um, and, and if that's true, and I heard what you said earlier about mid-July being about as late as we can go here with, with a viable colony going into the winter and not being queen right. So in your opinion, should I just go ahead and buy a queen and, and hope that they accept her? Or, or what, what should I do in this, this situation? You should go back into that colony and make certain that you're now, so you're seeing no cap brood at all, correct? Except correct. No, so no drone, no drones, no cap drones, nothing. Right. All right. So that means that there haven't been, a, there hasn't probably hasn't been a laying queen in that colony for a long time. And then, so what you might be seeing and you may be seeing this, now, now this is speculation, Ben, you might be seeing the efforts of laying workers in that colony. And that brood will look like regular brood, but you'll see multiple eggs in cells, but you're saying you see no eggs at all. That's right. None, no, no multiples, nothing. All right, no. so what, when, I re, when I get into this situation you're in, I, ha, I go through the entire colony, look for a virgin queen. So that's what okay. I would first do, um, but it's really not. It's not. You're you're explaining the situation. That's that's. Um, how's the population? Seems pretty good. I mean, this is only our second year, so we're still novices with all this. But it it seems pretty. Uh, there were bees all over the the frames in the lower deep. Yeah. So. All right. So um, you know, you got nine days. If you've seen. You've seen larvae, see if it caps as, as regular brood, worker brood. If that's the case, then you've got a laying queen in there. You just haven't been able to see her. And she went out on a mating flight or didn't get mated or didn't lay right away. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in a swarm, that colony obviously swarmed. In a swarm situation, um, you know, usually you can get a queen back up and running in like, you know, 14 days, 14 to 18 days. And then usually if it works right, uh, you'll have a laying queen in that colony and still have cat brood. But in your case, it didn't work that way. So the, the jury's out on whether or not that colony is queen right and will survive. Um, you know, but you can't just buy a queen and put them in there and put her in there. Because if it's, if there's, if there is a queen in there, they, the colony will kill it. You just waste your money. Um, if there's no queen in there, that means that the colony has some laying workers, but I, I it doesn't sound like it. Um, you know, so you, yeah, you're in trouble with that colony. You might want to consider combining it with another one, or do you have more than one? No, just the one. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, you're in, then you're in big trouble <laughs> because <laughs> you should you should always have a couple colonies. 
you know, to, to get along. Bill, if, if he had a second colony, then he'd put a frame of eggs in to confirm. Yes, you would give it the right. egg test if he had another colony, right. He, he didn't and say he, there were supersedure cells in there? No, there's not. There wouldn't be any supersedure cells in that in that colony. He's talking about, I think, swarm cells. Uh, they were on the side. There was there, cells. I thought, yeah, side. I, thought, I, I thought they might be emergency cells that I saw. Closed well, emergency they're emergency cells. cells. That means that you had a laying queen in there. But, you know, like, um, because you, you need an egg to do that. You know, you okay. need eggs for emergency cells, and there wouldn't be any reason for emergency cells um, under this circumstance. Um, you know, so your goal is to find out if that colony's queen right. If not, I think you're going to lose it this year. I mean, that would be my guess. You know, unless you want to um, um, get a frame of eggs from somebody else, and then in 24 hours, you'd know if that colony was queen right or not. Can I ask a question about this? Yeah. Um, so he said that he has, sounds like, supersedure cells. What Wouldn't it be possible that the... Uh, the bees decided to supersede this poorly laid queen and they turned those eggs that she did lay into queen cells? But he's not seeing any eggs. No, he's seeing capped cells. Capped queen cells on the side of the frame, he said, no? Oh, I don't, I thought they were open. Were they, are they capped, Ben? There, there were a couple that were open, but there were also a couple that were closed. They had that, that sort of peanut look on the side. Yeah, but they might they might not there might not be a queen in there. So what happens is the queen eats all eats the eats the cap around in a little semicircle. She comes out, but it's on a flap, it just closes again. So you have to look very close at those cells to make certain that there's you know something in them. There they could have dead queens in them, could have a lot of things. I don't think you've got queens coming on in that colony. The open cells you're seeing are from the swarm. You know, so uh, I have to say that I have over and over um, been sure that I was queenless because I they swarmed and I didn't I wasn't as usual patient enough and uh, spent money on queens because she was in there or she was busy mating um, and you got them killed. I mean, there's just been so many times, especially especially in my first couple of years. So, like the situation that Ben's describing yeah. that like over and over, I've been sure, but um, she was busy being mated and I needed to wait longer. Um, yeah, we'll see what, and and he's, yeah, he's on the, but so he's on the cusp of, of going over to a lane working colony because yeah. he's not seeing any cap drone or any cap, any cap brood. So that's 21 days and 24 yeah. days and no eggs. So that means that that colony has been essentially queenless for three weeks or almost four. So, I mean, the timing on his colonies is critical. You know, that, that's sort of like the key to what's going on there. Now, Ben, it's, it's his second year. So um, if he was doing regular inspections, and I'm not being critical now, Ben, you would have known when that colony actually swarmed. And from then on, you put it on a vigil to make sure it comes up queen right. You know, uh, so you give it, only a small amount of time to come up queen right. And then you got to have another colony that has uh, a colony that's laying. And then you can put, as Lauren suggested, the test is to put eggs in a colony like yours, Ben. And then if it's queen right, they'll just take care of them like their regular brood. If it's not queen right, they will draw emergency cells. That only takes. 36 hours and you can see evidence of it. Right? But with one colony, you're at a disadvantage. Okay, thanks. All right. All right, so I was always thinking, um, does the electric fence hurt the bees? Um, well, no, but I have noticed bees that will crawl onto an electric fence and then um, they're fine because they're not grounded, but they are, they can be attracted to it, but it doesn't really kill them. All right, Lauren, let's see what we got. All right, Jeffrey, free beehives my second year. Uh, I've recently been seeing very low mycons. When I do sugar rolls, 
to check mites. I was wondering if I should still treat the bees prior to overwintering them or should I just leave them overwinter without my treatments? Well, you're doing them a little soon. I would wait until um, sometime in late August to do your mite check again, Jeffrey. I'll guarantee you, you will see more mites at that point. And I think I agree with um, Lauren on that and alcohol wash and all that's much better than a sugar shake. And uh, so I'm hoping you read that. And <clears throat> maybe talk about the burn state. Yeah, if you, if you have foul brood in any colony that you have, uh, American foul brood especially, and you can use the ropey test on that. You don't have to um, buy an expensive test kit for that. Or you call Mark. Creighton, our bee inspector, he'll come out and take a look at your colony and diagnose your, your um, brood problem. And then uh, you can, um, then if it's American foul brood, they burn it. Right? We live in a burn state, which means that you cannot have, you can't keep a colony with American foul brood in your apiary, right? The state takes over, the uh, state entomologist is, is, then has jurisdiction over the colony and they burn it. All right, so that's just the fact. Great effects on bees. And were there effects on bees from the Canadian wildflower? I don't know. I thought about that myself. There was lots of uh, part particulate in the air, <clears throat> but I don't think it made a difference to the bees. It will Bill? box. Yeah. Oh, in hold California. On. Let, me let me let me finish. Yeah. Wrong. Right. Uh, there was a lot of particulate in the air. <clears throat> it does block some light. But bees see in the UV spectrum, so it doesn't really make much difference. I didn't see any effects from the Canadian wildfires. Fires. Yes, Ralph. In California, uh, beekeepers reported that bees didn't fly uh, last year when those heavy, heavy fires were because the smoke was blocking smoke. Yeah. the U okay. UV uh, the UV rays. It could be. I mean, if that was the case, but I, we had we had some some days when the smoke was actually. Um, you could sense it, you could smell it. And, but a lot of times in our case, it was really high in the atmosphere, so. Um, you don't think it's worthwhile doing a, a, a alcohol wash until the 1st of August? I think you, when, we're, when you have to get it as far, uh, far down on the brood cycle. So in the, right now, bees are dying at a higher rate than and the queen is recruiting new ones. So when that happens sometime in, in late, uh, early June, mid June or so. So at this point, brood is not as, even though it might seem like there's a lot of brood in your colonies, um, there's less of it than there was when they were building for the flow, right? So bees have started to actually prepare for winter by not producing as much brood, all right? So, um, so you wanna make certain that when you're testing for mites in the end of the season, you're gonna get a more accurate count as more of the brood is uncapped and there's less available for mites to go into. That's why later in, in the end of August is a perfect time. Beginning of September, you're gonna find a lot of mites. And then, and then, by the way, the temperature profiles are a lot more, um, <clears throat> a lot more intolerance for things like Formic Pro. So yeah, I should wait. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Don't take off honey from a hive. Can that hive become honey bound? Um, if you don't take, no. So whoever iPhone is, um, you know, the way a colony gets honey bound is if you put a lot of frames in that you had in storage and then they, and then they, um, um, and then they build a lot of, you see, a, a colony will only put as much honey in their colony as they need. They don't like fill every single frame and every, they, they preference, they allow the queen some, uh, some space to lay. Now, if you do find a colony that has a full deep above it, no place for the queen to lay, and somehow or another, they have filled the second, the bottom deep in with honey and there's no room for, then, then I suggest that you, you might have to take some action. And at that point you would take some frames of honey out, spin them out your deeps and put them back in. So the queen had some place to lay, but 
Um, that's not usually, an, uh, I don't know, I never had that problem you know, where, where a colony was honey bound. I mean, I know people talk about it, but an actual colony that was honey bound that, that wouldn't, that sacrificed brood for honey. They usually don't do that. But of course, then again, I always have my colonies supered up. So they have plenty of um, place, places to put honey. So. Hey, not, Bill. Yeah. If you use smaller colonies, like if you use 100% nukes, well, you use eight frame, they can get bound up pretty quick. Oh, yeah. So I, yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking 10 frame, Mike. And, you know, so I wasn't, I, you know, I'm not figuring it, you know, they, yeah, they can get honey bound. Um, but they, they should work their way out of it somehow or another. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with being, uh, dealing with colonies that are honey bound. Normally mine act okay. Now, if a colony was going to be, see, even my singles I ran this year, they were occupying eight frames with brood in the deep. And then they would, they put a little crest of honey out on the far frames, but only a shoulder. All the honey was in, all the honey in some pollen was in the first super. And then the second super was all honey. Um, so I, they seemed perfectly okay to run that way. And they didn't, they didn't, they, they didn't, uh, but I had a place for them to lay. And I had a place for them to put honey too. So it's ropey test for Falco. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. What else we got here? Two hands raised. All right, let's go for it. Julie. Oh, oh hi. So um, I'm new to beekeeping, and uh, I got two hives this year from uh, a guy called Ted Jones, who, uh, who I've had a, a very good experience with. And, uh, and I got a mentor, because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I live on a horse farm in Granby. And, um, and I was wondering, um, so I've, I've had like three swarms since I've, I've got these bees. Um, the first swarm, they swarmed in uh, the, on the 11th of July of June, actually. Um, and I managed to catch them, which is completely new for me. I'd never done this before. Um, and um, rehoused them and created a new hive. And this went quite smoothly and, and it was quite easy. Um, and since then, um, so I'm now, I now have three hives. And since then they have swarmed another two times. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, we, li we, live, we live in, a, in the middle of a, a reserve and the, it's full of big trees and they went and, and went in these very high branches. I couldn't catch them. Um, so I let them go. But um, I was wondering if anyone had been experiencing uh, an unusual rate of swarming of swarms mm -hmm. this year. And, um, and if there's a problem with, with my bees or the location or but they, they seem to be doing quite well. I mean, my mentor seems to think that they, two of the queens are doing gangbusters and I'm currently running on two deeps. And, uh, and um, yeah, um, so this is where I am, I'm at. Yes. Um, well, so, so a colony that is, so, so theoretically, if you, if you read the literature on swarming, What's happening is the colony is trying to find a balance between its existing population and what it will give up to reproduce. Now, um, if it's really prolific, if that queen is really prolific, there will be what they refer to as the prime swarm, which you say you caught yeah. and you started a new colony so that you have that queen in that colony. You're, and then they made another queen Mm -hmm. and she came on and laid well she's laying eggs both queens you know the, the queen that had left is uh is doing well yeah, yeah she's fine okay. yeah that's she's a new queen anyway yeah. and the second queen now what when did they swarm before they made a queen they swarm a second time the secondary swarm was right after the primary swarm like eight it's days later yeah, well, a week later, I think. A week yeah. later, they swarmed a second time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that means that they swarmed with a virgin queen the second time. Okay. So, yeah. So, all right. So, and then, 
And then did they swarm a third time? And I think the second hive that I bought, I swarmed. Uh, and I'm pretty sure because I went in, in the hive uh, about 10 days ago and found a couple of, uh, of uh, those, um, those queen cells hanging under a frame. Um, yeah. And uh, my mentor said, you know, at this point, you just got to let them do what they need to do. So uh, I'm guessing this, this cell hatched because I went back into the hive last week and I, I found a queen and they had cleaned those two queen cells. Um, I didn't find any eggs. There were still some broods. Um, so it was, and I think it's looking okay. I'm just waiting for that queen to start laying again. Yes, that's what you, that's your job there. Start, wait till that queen is start laying. Yeah, no, yeah. it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's an unusual uh, swarm season. Um, that colony, the genetics of that particular colony and that queen are such that, um, she made me an extraordinary amount of brood maybe and and they swarmed a second and a third time or or just a second time i can't I, I don't know if i got you clearly but anyway um it's not unusual for a colony to swarm twice but it's not the kind of colony you want to reproduce in your yard so if a colony is doing a lot of secondary tertiary swarming that's a you know you want to try to refrain from reproducing that particular queen right okay. because what we want to try to do is um, manage colonies that will, you know, if they swarm, that's fine. That's a reproductive uh, urge, not something that we can really uh, control. But if they continue to some, you know, I've had colonies that swarmed a third and a fourth time till there was no population left in a colony. That's just genetics. Yeah. And um, so it wasn't particularly bad, but lots of colonies did swarm this year. Yeah. Um, so, um, and because it was such a strong flow, I think there were more more colonies swarmed than normal. Okay. Right, so okay. I I don't I wouldn't be concerned with what you ran up against. Okay. See if you can get those colonies over the winter and make certain that that other colony. I was wondering if I also lead you to the location. I mean, you know, they live in a field, and uh, I obviously um, asked my mentor. Um, uh, you know, she, she pointed out uh, uh, the place, and I put them there. And, I'm, I was just wondering if there's something there that's actually bothering them and- No, 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 okay. no, they made honey, right? Did you have a super on them? No, I've not put any super on now. But, no. they, but they put honey in the top box, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, I, wouldn't, um, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about the location. I think you probably got a decent location. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Most, most locations in Connecticut are fine, except down the shore, they have some problems. Yeah. Okay. It's not always high density, Darlene, that makes a colony swarm, but lots of times they will if they're, you know, especially singles, you know, like um, they, they'll, they'll sense that they don't have a lot of open space and they'll take off. So your job as somebody who's going to, if you're going to run your colony in single, you got to get in during swarm season. You have, I found one colony that made no cells and just went right through swarm season, making big populations of bees and storing lots of honey. And every other one of the single boxes that I tried to raise um, this year all had um, rounds of swarm cells, which I knocked down and kept them, kept them queen right until I got Lyme disease. So then I got, I got Lyme disease and I had a particularly hard time with it. And I missed um, two weeks of beekeeping and two of those colonies uh, took off into the trees because I wasn't doing my 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 swarm cell stuff. Oh, wow. So um, yeah, yeah, it got bad. All right. From Tim Crimmins. All right, what do we got? Tim, Did you raise your hand. Hi. Okay. You have a question. Yeah. Okay, Tim. Yes. Hi there. Our question is, um, we only have one hive and we'd like to get a second, but uh, we, we know about robbing and we want to know if that's a concern or just tell, tell us what we should know about, about robbing when you have multiple hives. Because we have Italian honeybees and we read that they are like known for robbing hives. Like they're more like notorious for that. Yeah. So, um, 
Okay, so uh, I'm just going to give you five minutes on ancestral lineage. There's no such actual thing in in our B world, although um, you will read lots of uninformed posts and writing about ancestral, ancestral lineage, but we really don't have, unless you bought um, Italians that were bred specifically with um, Italian drones and it's, you know, and they were, they're, they're closer to genetically to Italians, then I'm sorry to say that you just have the same bees we all have, which are just mutts mostly Carniolans and some Italian mix. It's a mixture, about 40% of each of that. Then there's probably a little Russian in them and all that. But so from an from a ancestral standpoint, um, you can let go of a lot of that thinking, right? Because it makes your beekeeping easier, by the way, and it's more truthful. So um, no, so they won't, you, you can put robber screens on your colonies to prevent them from being robbed. So you don't have to worry about that. You can have apiaries with um, 10, 15, you know, up to 20 colonies and never have any robbing, right? So as long as there's a flow on, bees won't rob, you know, but if, but there are certain times a year when the dearth comes where stronger colonies will go and rob weaker ones. In that case, you know, it behooves you to make certain that your colonies in your apiary are both about equal strength, which would discourage robbing because then you can, you know, each colony can defend itself. Um, so, so there's lots of ways to deal with robbing and you can put as many colonies as you want in your yard and work your, um, your colonies in such a way that they are, as I said, are equalized. And then if some robbing does occur, you have to go figure out why. Because usually if it's, if the colony's getting robbed, it's weak. It could be queenless, something like that. So, yeah. so don't worry too much about that. And then I just also wanted to say that like we just started beekeeping last month. We just oh. got Italian honeybees and we're kind of new to this. We thought that this would kind of help us like get more knowledge. So we're kind of glad we did this and we hope that we like join other bee talks and yeah, yeah. You know, you're, something. yeah, you guys are doing great. I mean, you know, uh, but you do need to have two colonies. Yeah, we're going to get more. Yeah. So because you be in Ben's situation, right, where he only has one colony. You're in that, but your colony is still queen, right? So you're lucky, um, you know, but, but if, if you have two, then you can share resources and figure out different problems that your colony has. Okay. Uh, hang in there. We need, uh, we need you guys to be uh, coming along as beekeepers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. All right. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, I know. Darling, you have no idea what I went through. Oh my God, it was horrible. Are you able to stop a swarm? There are multiple caps. Are you able to stop a swarm when there are multiple cap queen cells? Well, you can go in there and knock all the queen cells down if you want. Um, you better get them before they're capped. I would not knock swing, swarm cells down in any colony that I didn't see a laying queen in with the swarm cells and that the swarm cells were not capped. So, you know, it was a great study for me this year with the singles because I made it a habit of if I came into one of those singles and I saw, because see, I only saw uncapped swarm cells because I was going in every five days. And that, that ensured that I only saw capped swarm cells. I mean, uncapped swarm cells. So, but if I, they got closer, and they looked like they were more mature, I would always make certain that there was a queen in that colony before I took any cells out and eggs. So it wasn't good enough for me to just see, um, uh, let's see, it wasn't good enough for me to just see a queen. I had to see eggs. I wanted to know that she was actually still laying. And I wanted to see one day old eggs. Now, so one day old eggs are eggs that are right in the center of that little Mercedes sign down in the bottom of the cell and they're standing directly up straight, right? Two day old eggs, they start to lean over a little bit. Three day old eggs, you can see they're, they're just teetering to when they fall over and become larva, all right? So, there's, so that's a technique you use uh, when you begin to learn more about queen's habits and laying. So there's, so you're looking in a colony, if you want to know if it's absolutely queen, right, 
if you find one day old eggs, you can pretty much see know for certain that that colony is queen ready, right? So uh, you, you hardly ever get tricked that way. Uh, and so if I didn't see eggs, then I'd be looking for a queen. So it's, um, you know, it's easy enough to do and it's the most exciting part of the season. Um, can but, you, but can you stop this? Are there once they're capped? Can you stop? stop no, the swarm? no. Once they're capped, if you if you once the swarm cells are capped, it, it's it's usually that day or the day after where the colony will swarm, or they're capped and they swarmed already, and you're looking at them and you're saying, oh, um, they, you know, there's a big population of bees in here, and even though I have these capped swarm cells, it doesn't look like they swarm. You really can't tell because a colony that has you know, 60,000 bees in it and 30,000 of them left still has 30,000 bees in it. And it looks like it's a really <laughs> robust colony, but it's already, it's already put 30,000 or 25,000 of those bees in a swarm, right? So no, once they're capped, if you start knocking down swarm cells after they're capped, thinking you know what you're doing, you'll probably end up making that colony hopelessly queenless. So once those cells are capped, leave it alone. Same thing with anybody who's dealing with swarm cells. You know, once you start to see swarm cells that are capped, if you're going to let that colony come up and be queen, right? Like uh, Julian's doing, you got to leave it alone now until it does that. You can't okay. give it forever, you. but you got to leave it alone. But Bill, there are more things you need to do besides removing the queen cells to prevent swarming, right? Uh, you can't prevent swarming, but manage it. Try to manage it is what you're what you're right. saying there's there's other techniques yeah but uh, what we're talking about swarm cells if they're there you know you can give them a lot right. of space early on you can harvest brood out of them managing swarms happens in may that's when you do it right then you take brood out of the you know out of the colonies and you know and manage it that way if you keep harvesting brood you can almost you can almost manage any colony from not swarming unless it's hell bent on swarming by uh, harvesting brood out of it early on in May. But you have to have some place to put that stuff. You know, so go yeah. for it, man. Yeah, I had a question. Um, what's the theory behind running a hive on one deep and two well, deep? Well, so it's a honey making. Right. So a lot of, um, so most of the commercial beekeepers at this point, and there's a very big movement to running colonies as singles. So this yeah. year I run doubles, but this year I ran a bunch of singles just to see what it was like. And it was a pain. I mean, yeah, they made a lot of honey, but um, but you have to actually manage the swarm piece of it very carefully. Is that right, Lauren? Yeah, or else they're going to take off on you because they don't have a lot of space to raise brood. Now there are some very although it is easier in terms of like moving boxes around. Oh, and finding everything and treatments yep. and everything else. So I mean, everything is in one box. Your queen will be in there if she's in there. You'll be able yeah. to see what's happening in terms of your honey buildup because it's in your supers right above it. You know, so yeah, so it, it's a question of managing the swarming period. That's, right, that's and that's a little bit more difficult than, now, if you're interested in this, Julian, there are, dare I say, um, is Facebook still working? There are groups that actually um, specialize in uh, single brood, single brood backs, yeah, single brood backs rearing, and you can, and you can. I, I am half French. Tom Sealy, um, and I have a, a couple of uncles in France who are beekeepers, so I, I've turned to them. Uh, well, obviously, recently because of the swarming uh, issues that I've had, and uh, and their questions were, uh, why are you running your hives on two deeps? Uh, we here run our hives on one single deep, and uh, and we get a lot of honey, like you just uh, that you just um, mentioned, and uh, it, and it's easier. Um, I was under the impression it's because the reason why we're running two deeps is just because of the harsh winters. So I didn't really know what to say to them when I, you know they asked me that question. Um, but uh, tradition is it, is it is it just because it's it's easier not to have to worry so much about the swarming uh in may that you guys run on no, actually, actually so the no so so double deeps are a tradition in the northeast 
Okay. And, you know, and it was like, you know, uh, well, you know, you're going to have to have a lot of honey in the top deep so they can get through the winter. Yeah. So we have harsher winters than unless you're, unless you're um, French relatives, you know, like I, it's an interesting comment that they told you it's easier. Well, it's easier for them because they're experienced beekeepers, but I think it'll be a little bit more difficult for you to learn on singles because you're going to really have to manage that swarm piece of it. So I would go back and ask them, you know, how they manage their swarms early yeah. in the spring in singles. But you could also run double deeps in a summer and then reduce it to a single in August, September through the winter. Well, then you have to figure out how you're going to feed them. Well, they true. Food, right. So it's if you, you can't reduce it to a single unless there's lots of honey in that single. Deep in the shallow. You want to overwinter them as a single. It gets it gets problematic. So it's a balance. So Julian, there's a lot of really interesting things in your future to learn about yeah. how you're going to manage your bees. It's been fun, for and, sure. And I want to know what, what your friends in France say. I mean, they make great honey there, but you know, we- They, they do, and, and they're like, they're harvesting tons of honey. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, following the advice of my mentor here, who I, who I really uh, connected with, and I'm really enjoying yeah. my presence. And, uh, and uh, you know, I gathered that here, you have to uh, build the colony big enough on those two deeps before you can actually put a super on. So for me, I don't think I'll be, you know, harvesting much honey this year because I bought two nukes and I'm now finding myself with three colonies and I'm trying to build them according to the advice of my mentor to two boxes before I can put any super on. So, yeah, I mean, so that's, you know, no. So, so I, I installed packages early, early late March packages and um, I made lots of honey on singles. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, you can do it. I think I probably made over, I would say over 125, maybe 100, maybe 150 pounds of honey on each colony. So oh, times wow. four. So okay. that would be, and then some of them built n not only two supers, but then end frames in their own colonies. So yeah, so they made a lot of honey this year. This year was a good honey flow. Okay. So, yeah, you could make honey just by mistake this year, like rock. <laughs> Ralph, you're quitting. You know, so look at just one more thing before we go, Ralph, because I'm sad. I'm sad about you being this being your last uh last year. Your last year of beekeeping. And then in New York. In New York. Oh, you're gonna keep bees in California? I think I'm gonna change over my son's yard and go to all mediums eight frame. Oh, okay. All right. So um yeah, so he's got a bunch of bees there for you. He's gonna give you work. He has backyard. He has a backyard. I can put bees in. Yeah, but so, what are you going to do about all of the smoke and the wildfires and all of that stuff out there in California? Well, it won't be a problem after the earthquake on the Hayward Fault. <laughs> yeah, you'll be in the ocean at that point. Let's see where, yeah. where, where you live. You'll be floating. Aquatic in the ocean. bees. We have aquatic. You know, bees. I would hang on to that kayak, Ralph, because you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for, for um, everybody.